Oh, okay. We're getting towards the end of this of this great week. Oh, well, forget this it. This is Eric. Stu. I'll introduce myself. <laughs> so, before I really start, I, I want to say thank you to a lot of people because this has been, I think, a really great conference. You know, when you go to a conference which is as, as widely spread out in terms of topics as this, you can't expect to understand everything. If you understand half of what a quarter of the people said, you're not doing so badly, I think, at these things. And I think this is an exception, because I reckon I understood about half of what three quarters of the people said, and I think that's a wonderful event to have happened. Um, I learned a lot from this meeting, and I'm sure, well, I'm sure we all did. So, <laughs> and I get compliments from my friends. <laughs> So I want to thank the organizers, that's Mateo and Christian and DeWitt and Enzo, who did a fabulous job of putting all this together. And I want to thank the... <laughs> and I want to thank ICTP for the, for the facilities and, uh, and Erica for all her efforts in this. And I don't know how much we all had to interact with Erica over this, but every time I had an interaction with her, I felt she was above and beyond the call of duty. And I think we need that. We should say thank you to both ICTP and, and to Erica. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> now, I'll, now I'll start talking about what I'm supposed to talk about. So um, this is a bit of a switch. And, and, and I, it's a bit embarrassing that it hardly fits at all in this conference, because I'm going to talk not about knotting in, in filaments and, and uh, rings and such like, and it has absolutely nothing to do with biology and very, very little to do with physics, uh, but it's about the fact that you can also have knots in surfaces, and um, it, it's a problem I've been working on, actually I've been working on it for a long time, but I've been working on it quite, quite a lot in the last few years. And I want to try to persuade you that at least um, entanglements in surfaces are interesting. And sometimes you can prove things about the surface problem that you can't prove about the, these um, uh, rings uh, knotted in three space. So this is joint work with um, four of my friends, um, Mashid Atapur and Chris Sotaros, who are both at University of Saskatchewan. Mashid started working in this general area, I think, when she was a... Uh, a, a a graduate student, oh, maybe she was a postdoc, I think a graduate student with Chris. Bucks van Rensburg, who's at York University uh, in Toronto, and DeWitt Sumners, my friend in the audience who, um, is, as you know, is at Florida State University. So they're the, uh, the cast of thousands. Well, why should we care about surfaces? So I want to give you just a few examples of where surfaces turn up and where they might be interesting. So the first of these is that... Um, Surfaces enclose vesicles, and red blood cells are a good example of, of a vesicle. And in the case of red blood cells, the, the, the surface is always a sphere. I mean, topologically, it's a sphere. You don't get red blood cells which, which are tori. Um, so um, we, we have this, this example. And vesicles, we've also seen some, something about vesicles in Giovanni Dietler's talk. Do you remember he had um, these pictures of circular DNA on a surface? And there were other expanded objects if it was at low density. And if the density went up, then they be, became more compact because there was a kind of an external pressure. So that's like a, a vesicle where you have an, an osmotic term. If you change the ionic strength of the solution outside the vesicle, then the, the object can compress or, or it can expand. And red blood cells can burst if, they, if you change the osmotic conditions enough. Well, polymer membranes is another thing on the same lines. You can have these form various kinds of, of vesicle systems. In, in, in magnets, if you think of a, an Ising problem, a series of up and down spins in a magnet, you have little regions of up spins. And if I'm in two dimensions, these are enclosed by, by simple closed curves in the simplest case, or maybe more complicated things where the, t where the curves can cross or can touch. And in three dimensions, they're enclosed by, well, three-dimensional surfaces. In four dimensions, by, um, by um, three manifolds. So there are examples in, in, in magnets where, where, where surfaces might play a role. But for me, I, I like them because they're just a natural, exam, a natural extension of simple closed curves. I want to remind you of two things about 
simple closed curves, at least on, on lattice models of these. If you, if you take the simple cubic lattice and you think of a simple closed curve in the simple cubic lattice, so often called polygons in, in the lattice, then we know that as these polygons get very big, the chance of them being knotted becomes very large. But we don't know anything at all about the relative probability, we don't know anything rigorously about the relative probability of um, a trefoil or um, a 4 1 knot or, or an unknot, for instance, for these things. So the, that, that's an old problem, been around 30 years, and uh, at the rigorous level, we don't know anything about it. It'll turn out with, with surfaces, that's a problem we can say something about under some circumstances. So um, here's some examples. Oh, I, I should say that I'm going to talk about four or five problems. If you get lost in any of the problems, wait a minute because there'll be a new problem and each of them you can start again um, because they're, they're essentially independent of one another. That's true to a very large extent. So here's some examples of, of um, surfaces. And first of all, I want to think of surfaces in three space. I'll, I'll pretty soon I'll be on the simple cubic lattice, Z3, Z3, but just think of them for the moment in three space. And these surfaces are going to have a single boundary curve. So they're they're not closed surfaces. So the simplest thing you could have is, is a sphere, something with the topology of a sphere, and I just cut out a disk in this. And so I'm left now with a punctured sphere, and the punctured sphere is a disk. So I've decomposed it into two disks. So now I have a disk with a boundary curve. And as somebody forgotten who reminded us this morning, that boundary curve is unknotted. But it doesn't have to be a sphere. I could take a torus and cut a hole in the surface of the torus, and now that could be knotted, because now I have a, um, a genus one surface, and so it's a possibility now that I have knotting. And the third one I want to mention is the Mobius band, and the distinction between the first two, the punctured sphere and the punctured torus, well, spheres and tori have an inside and an outside, and so I, re I re remember that information when I puncture it, and so these are orientable surfaces, the Mobius band, is non-orientable. And my main reason for mentioning this now is to say that everything else I'm going to talk about from now on is about orientable surfaces. We do have results on the non-orientable case, but I'm not planning to talk about any of that today. So it's all orientable. Now, from time to time, I'll forget, and I won't make this proviso that my surface is orientable. And you will quite rightly say, hey, what if it was a projected plane? And I'm telling you now, <laughs> In case I forget later, everything's orientable. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about these sort of things for the moment, surfaces with a single boundary. So here's a punctured torus. So in this picture here, here's my torus, and here I cut out um, a little piece from the, um, from, the punctured, from, the, from the torus. So I start with the torus, and I cut this out, and now I have a punctured torus. And what I want to do is to peel back this, the boundary of this, of this hole, pull it back this way and this way and this way and this way. And what do I get? I, I, get, um, I get a disk with two bands on it. So I've got a disk and I've got two bands sticking off this. So that picture there is a better, from, me, from my point of view, that's a better picture of a punctured torus than that one. So this is what you should be, should be having in mind. So that picture, you could you can check, has a single boundary curve, and it's an unknotted, um, it's an unknotted curve. It's living in three space. But it doesn't have to be unknotted. So here's another picture. So this is also this um, surface with the shading on it is a, is a punctured torus. It's a single boundary curve, and the boundary curve now is the, is the uh, figure eight knot. It's 4-1. So we can have, we can have um, knotted boundaries. I go to another one. Here's another one that I'm going to compare. So the picture on the left is, uh, is a punctured torus. So this is the surface that you see here. This is the disk, if you like. And here are my two bands, which are, which are making this, um, this punctured torus. There's a single boundary curve. And in this case, the boundary curve is unknotted. But I could, take, I could disconnect this, I could cut this uh, band, and I could install some twists in it, and then glue it back on again. And that's what I've done in this case. I keep taking this thing apart inadvertently. I'm just going to, the batteries will fall out if I'm not careful. 
So in this case, I've taken it apart, installed twist in both of these in the same sense, and um, I've got a, a new surface, and it's not difficult to check, I mean, you just do it, that the single boundary curve still, but now the boundary curve is a trefoil, and in fact, it's a, it's a plus trefoil. If I'd installed the twist the, in the other direction, but the same twist in both of them, I would get the, min I'd get the minus trefoil. If I'd installed a plus twist in one of the bands and a minus twist in the other, I would have got the figure eight knot. So I can get a, a bunch of knots. Of course, they have to be genus one knots, because I can't have a genus two knot in, in, on a, as the boundary of a, um, of a punctured torus. I'd have to have a, a higher genus object to do that. So now, the kind of question that um, we were interested in, this is mainly work with Bux van Rensburg a long time ago, the kind of question we were interested in was asking, how likely is this compared to this? If, if I do this at random in a, in a lattice, I embed these things in the simple cubic lattice, and I ask for the likelihood of this to happen compared to the likelihood of this, what, what proportion of the surfaces will be of one type and what kind of will, will be of another type. So the tools we have for doing this only, in fact, answer questions to exponential order. All of these things grow. The number of embeddings grows at an exponential rate as you vary the area of the, of the surface. And you can ask, do these guys with unknotted boundary grow at the same exponential rate as these guys with a, with a trefoil boundary? And that's a question which, in the, um, in the case of simple closed curves, we don't know the answer to it. OK, so you, 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 get, the, you get the question which is involved. Of, of, of the five problems, or four or five problems that I'm going to talk about, technically, this is by far the most difficult. And I'm not really going to tell you anything about how you do the proof for this case. I'll try to give some idea of the proofs for the other cases. This one is a, is a complete mess um, to try to, to try, well, it's an enormously long proof, so I don't want to try to say much about it. So I embed this in the simple cubic lattice um, <clears throat> with area n, which means it has n unit squares, n plaquettes, I embed this guy the, with a trefoil boundary in the simple cu cubic lattice, area n, and I ask, how, how does the number of embeddings of these as the area changes compare to the number of embeddings as these as the area changes? And it's a theorem, or at least this is a statement, and then I'll give a theorem. So I want to consider these orientable surfaces now with one boundary curve, but I, don't, I'm, I haven't fixed the genus yet. And now they have some genus, G0, so torus, it would be genus 1, embedded in, in Z3, the simple cubic lattice. And I'm going to call Sn of Kg G0 the number of embeddings of these with area n modulo translation. I don't care if two things, I won't count two things as different if they can be translated into one another, which have where the boundary has not type Kg and the genus of the surface is G0. Okay, of course, and G, the genus of the knot, has to be less than or equal to the genus of the surface. So now you might like to make a guess from what you know about the business of, of random knotting, whether um, how the exponential growth rate of these things depends on the knot type and how the exponential growth rate depends on the genus. So you're, uh, I'll pause for a second to let you make a, make a guess. Um, <clears throat> So, I'll, and I'll tell you the answer. It's the kind of quiz that students like in lectures where you ask a question and then promptly tell them the answer. So here's the theorem. So if I look at the number of these guys, the number of these embeddings, with kg and g0 fixed, I take the logarithm, I divide by n, and let n go to infinity. So this thing, this limit, is the exponential growth rate. Then, first of all, the limit exists, which is not easy to show, and it's independent of both kg and g0. So this says that the exponential growth rate of tori whose boundary curve is the unknot is the same as tori whose boundary curve is the trefoil, is the same as those whose boundary curve is the figure eight, and is the same as the exponential growth rate of punctured spheres. So it's, it's an interesting question because, or an interesting, I think, an interesting answer because that's exactly what we expect. That's analogous to what we expect in the, in the case of simple closed curves in, um, in Z3. 
but we haven't got a hope. We have no way, no mechanism for proving that in the, in the case of the simple closed curve. Okay, so that's, the, that's problem number one. So now I'm going to go up a dimension. I believe this is the first talk where we've talked about anything above three dimensions. So now I'm in four space. Now, in the same way that simple closed curves can knot in three space, spheres can knot in four. I mean, um, simple closed curves are, are um, circles. They're one sphere. So two spheres can knot in four space. You just need two extra dimensions for this to be, this to be a possibility. So I want to look at knotted two spheres in four space. So we know if we're on the simple cubic lattice that the, um, the number of embeddings of simple closed curves in the simple cubic lattice which are knotted is enormously larger than the number which are unknotted. So do we get the same thing in, in this high dimensional problem? So let me tell you what these um, curves are going to look like. So I'm going, to, I'm going to do this by spinning. So let me do spinning one dimension down to get the idea. So if I'm in two dimensions, I take a line in two dimensions, and I draw a curve which starts and ends in this line, and I spin it about this line. So I now go, I just rotate, rotate the curve about that line. Then what do I get? Well, I get a sphere in, in, in three space. I've just gone up a dimension by doing this. So now it's the same thing when I, when I spin about a plane. So I start in three space. And I have this, this plane here. I have two points in the plane, and I have a curve which starts and ends in the plane and otherwise lives in the half space defined by the plane, one side or the other of the half space. And now I spin about this plane in much the same way that I spun about this line here. So I go up a dimension. Each point here on this curve becomes a circle in four space. And so what I get is a two sphere in four space. And now there's a, there's a nice theorem which says that this is vague, but I'll say it vaguely, that if this bit here is knotted, it remains knotted when I spin. The fundamental group is invariant under spinning, is what it's saying. So I know how to construct knotted two spheres in four space. Here's an example, of perhaps the most famous example, the spun trefoil. It's been known for a long time. And um, we can't do that home. Go back. I'd like to be able to ask the question, if I'm now putting these, um, these surfaces in the, the four-dimensional cubic lattice, Z4, what can I say about the probability of uh, knotting among these, among these um, two spheres in Z4? So if that's the question you'd like the answer to, it's time to quit because I don't know. But I can do a sort of a toy version of that problem. And let me explain what I mean by that. So instead of doing the whole of I'll do it in D dimensions, because I'll need it both in three and four dimensions. Instead of working in the whole of the, of the lattice, I'm going to, look, I'm going to work in a, a tubular sublattice. So if I'm in ZD, I'm going to take uh, I have the coordinates x1 up to xd for the, um, their integer coordinates in ZD. One of these is going to be um, half infinite, so it's going to be Z plus. And the rest of them x2 to xd are going to um, form um, a d minus 1 cube. So what I've got is, is a high dimensional cube cross uh, an infinite line. That's the, that's the idea. I don't care how big this cube is. You can make it any size you like, but I do need this boundedness in these directions. And I'll explain probably on the next slide why this is, why this is handy and why it allows us to do the problem. So why are tubes easier? It turns out, well, they control the, um, the space in all except one of the dimensions. Things can't get too big in all except one dimension. And secondly, because we now have a sort of a quasi-one-dimensional object, it turns out we can use linear algebra techniques to solve these problems. And I don't know whether I'll have time at the end, but if I have time, I'll say some, something more at a technical level about why those two things work. But you should think of the fact that because we have... Um, because it's bounded in, in um, d minus 1 dimensions, I, I never have to do too much when I'm doing things in those dimensions. And I have a sort of a preferred direction that I can run along. And it's that preferred direction which allows me to, to prove um, some of these results. 
So, if I have these um, two spheres in tubes in Z4, and I put them, so I have this tube, I don't care how big the tube is, L by L by L by L by L, three dimensions, and then infinite in the other direction, then, well, you can read it for yourself, all except exponentially few, sufficiently large embeddings of two spheres in sufficiently large tubes in Z4 are knotted. So that's, that's exactly analogous to the lower dimensional theorem about simple closed curves in, in Z3. Um, I, I say whether or not this is true without a tube constraint is open. That's something DeWitt and I have been working on for 30 years. I think it's a hard problem. It's, um, it's difficult to do. Well, either it's difficult to do or we just didn't quite catch on to what the, what the clever trick is that somebody else will spot it before the lecture's over. I once heard Paul Erdos give a talk. You know, he used to ask these famous questions in his lectures. And somebody said to him, and, and he would um, offer a, a monetary reward if you solved his problem. Somebody said to him, what was your biggest mistake in, in this? And he said, I, I gave a problem for 100 bucks, and a guy in the back, uh, back row solved it before I finished lecturing. So, so you should get to work on this. It's um, this part. So how do you prove this? So I'm, I'm not going to say very much about this, but tell you two sort of facts, which are, which are key ideas. So if I think of, of two spheres, and I, connect the, I take the connect sum of those two spheres, I get a sphere. So if I take a sphere, and I connect sum with a sphere which is knotted, I get a knotted two-sphere, if you like, because Alexander polynomial multiplies under connect sum. That's one, that's one argument which would do that. So if I could prove that all two spheres contained in their connect sum are not a two sphere, I'd be home and dry. Now it turns out that the solution to that is a pattern theorem. I'll explain in a second what I mean by a pattern theorem. But here's another way to do it. If I'm in four space and I take slices um, perpendicular to this uh, long direction, what will I see? I'll see bits of three dimensional space. I might see a knot, a single curve in that. Not, not a link and not something more complicated, but a single simple closed curve. It might or might not be knotted. Now, there are lots of knots which can't occur as cross sections of the two sphere in four space. The knot has to be sliced, so three one can't occur, but lots of knots can occur. Some of those knots, when they occur, could occur in an unknotted two sphere. So the square knot can occur as a cross section of an unknotted two sphere. But there are some knots proved by, by DeWitt in the um, 1960s sometime, which if they occur in a cross section of a two sphere, ensure that the two sphere is knotted. So six one will do the trick, and nine, DeWitt? Would, nine forty six will do the trick. And so what I, what I, another way to prove this is to, is to take these little slices and show that with high probability, at least one of these slices is 61 or is 946. And if you can prove that, you know that it's knotted. So if you can prove that that happens in all except exponentially few cases, then you know that it's knotted in all except exponentially few cases. So what you need then is to prove that this thing happens. And that's, um, that's a pattern theorem. So what is a pattern theorem? Think of a, a zero one law in probability. Imagine you have a sequence of independent events and something could happen every time. If it could happen every time and the events are independent, it will happen with a probability which approaches one as you have more and more events. So imagine flicking a coin and saying, I'd like 100 ed heads in, in succession. Well, if I split my sequence of coins into groups of 100, 100 heads is not zero probability. It has probability one half to the 100. That's not zero. And so if I now, instead of doing it 100 times, I do it an enormously large number of times, the probability of it never happening is 1 minus the small number to the power, the number of uh, uh, groups of 100. That's going to go to zero. And so the probability that it happens is going to go to 1. Pattern theorems don't have the advantage of independence. And so the trick in proving a pattern theorem is to control the dependence in the problem. And that's where all of the difficulty in the, all, all the technical difficulty comes in. Anyway, it turns out that for these um, two spheres in tubes, you can prove a pattern theorem. 
and you're home and dry by one of those two arguments. Well, why two spheres? Why don't we look at two manifolds without boundary? So now I have orientable two manifolds without boundary for this talk. So now I have spheres, um, tori, and so on. Any, anything as a two manifold with no boundary. Just, th I mean, do, don't worry about it being a manifold. We probably don't even care about it being a manifold ourselves. We could probably do it if it was a manifold with singularities and things. But it's just sort of a simple, nice, smoothish surface or piecewise linear surface. Um, so here's the theorem. So all except exponentially few large embeddings of sufficiently large embeddings of two manifolds without a boundary in sufficiently large tubes in Z4 are knotted. So that's the theorem. But you might very well say, what, what does it mean? Um, what do I mean by a knotted two manifold? So this is this question. So any two manifold can be seen as sort of the connect sum of a bunch of things. And if if I take a two-manifold and I connect some with a knotted two-sphere, then I get something which is knotted. I don't destroy the knotting by doing this connect sum. So if I can show that a two-sphere appears somewhere in the connect sum, then I know that the, the object is knotted. And so it's the same argument. You use these pattern theorem tricks. You have to prove the pattern theorem for this case. You use these pattern theorem tricks to show that a spun trefoil, say, will occur somewhere in this as I run up the tube. Uh, is there a corresponding theorem without the tube constraint? Um, I, well, there isn't. We, we don't know it, and we would dearly like to be able to prove the corresponding thing in the absence of this, of this tube constraint. Okay, so let's come down the dimension. Oops. Here we are. So let's look at two manifolds without boundary, so closed two manifolds, things like um, spheres and tori and things, but now in three space. So, can these be knotted? Well, a sphere can't be knotted in, in three space, but can, can we knot um, more complicated two manifolds? <clears throat> so I'll draw some pictures. So here's a, a torus, and this is a torus whose center line is knotted. So I can't smoothly deform this into sort of the standard picture of a torus, and so I can define this as, as being knotted. And I can ask about the relative chance of of uh, finding this, if I look at, um, uh, look at um, say, tori in, um, in um, three space. <clears throat> but I can have more complicated situations. I love this picture. So this is um, where the, the other um, generator of the homotopy group is, is, is knotted. So this is a torus, all right. It's got this, this is a surface. This is the hole running through it. And if you like, the hole is, a, is knotted as a, as a figure eight knot. So who was the guy who wrote the paper about um, cubes with knotted holes? Bing? Bing, yeah. So this is, a, this is an example, of an old example of many years ago by Bing. OK, so we, we'd like to, uh, I'd like to ask the question. If I look at all tori in um, Z3, in the simple cubic lattice, with area n, I let the area go to infinity, what are the chances that the that the torus will be knotted, or will have some particular knot type. Maybe will be uh, will be um, amitisotopic to this guy, or to the previous one, the one in blue. So I could, there are two two um, separate questions that one can ask about this. So I could either simply consider all surfaces without boundary, all two manifolds without boundary in Z3, where I don't control the genus. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to have spheres and tori and higher genus objects there and ask this question, what are the chances of it being knotted? Or I could fix the genus. So I could just look, for instance, at, at tori. And the, the techniques for handling these two are completely different. So um, again, we, we can't do it unless we have this tube constraint. But if we have this tube constraint, then it turns out that we can say something about both those questions. How's my timing? Do I have 15 minutes? Or oh, 10, anyway. Yeah, OK. OK, so let's, let's talk about surfaces where the genus isn't fixed. So remember, 
the, these, these are these objects where um, they're going to be confined in this tube, enormously wide tube, in, in Z3. And if I could show that these surfaces with high probability contained a knotted torus, something like this, as part of their connect sum, then I'd be done, because I can't unknot that farther up or farther down the, the tube. I can't sort of get past it in the tube. I have a little, it'll be in a little region of the tube and that'll be knotted. So that's the way to handle that problem. And again, you do this by a pattern theorem, which says that any event will happen with high probability if the object, the, um, the two manifold, gets big enough. And, you, uh, and you're using the tube constraint there to use linear algebra techniques to prove the pattern theorem. And in the second case, okay, so the theorem is that all except exponentially few surfaces in tubes in um, Z3 where the, where the tube is big enough and where the size of the, of the, um, of the surface, the two manifold, is big enough and not with a probability which appears, which approaches one, actually approaches one exponentially fast. If you look at surfaces with fixed genus, and again, I invite you to, to make a guess about this. So now I've got, uh, let, let's fix the genus at one to get the idea. So now I have a, a torus in, in this tube. And now, remember the torus is, 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 is this surface, but it's a closed surface, there's no boundary. And now I'll, I'll tie this, this um, center line in a particular knot. So it's, uh, it's tied as the trefoil or the figure eight or something, or it's unknotted. So now, Yes, do you think that they are going to, the knotted ones are going to dominate, or the unknotted ones will dominate, or they're all about the same? So the answer is <coughs> that all of these things, if I fix the knot, if I fix the um, genus, say the torus, and I fix the knot type of the torus, not the boundary curve, these don't have boundary curves anymore, I fix the knot type of the center line of the torus, then all of these surfaces grow at the same exponential rate. So again, that's analogous to this problem of simple closed curves in Z3. Well, we don't know that, um, uh, that um, simple closed curves with fixed, with fixed knot type will grow at the same exponential rate. Okay, so this, oops, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. So in this case, uh, this is true. And if I change the genus, same thing. Uh, something with genus one tied in a knot or something with genus two with no knots, all the same exponential rate. Fix the genus, fix the knot, knot type of the, of the, uh, of the center line. Uh, the exponential rate is independent of those, of those um, quantities. So here's, the, here, here's a, a certain kind of take home message that if you have large flexible surfaces in lattices, they're typically embedded in complicated ways. And that surely is no surprise. I mean, everybody in this community must guess that if the thing is big and flexible, it's going to be um, embedded badly in, in, in some sense. So the, uh, the, the, the broad general picture is no surprise. But the fact that you can prove some things for these surface cases, which you can't, or you can't prove the corresponding thing in the simple closed curve case, is, um, is nice. So I just want to spend five more minutes saying a couple of technical things. So pattern theorems. So I've already said something about what a pattern theorem is. You, you, you take some, you take some for me, you take some geometrical object, some object, and you take some little thing which can occur in this object, and you ask, if it can occur, will it occur somewhere where the object is big enough? That's the, that's the idea. There are a lot of ways to prove the pattern theorems. Uh, the, the, these, first, these first appeared in the, um, in the combinatorics literature in, in 1963 in a wonderful paper by Harry Keston, which was called On the Number of Self-Avoiding Walks. And he wanted to prove, uh, I won't tell you what he wanted to prove because I'd have to tell you too much about self-avoiding walks, but he wanted to prove a result about the asymptotic number, behavior of the numbers of self-avoiding walks. And Somewhat sort of incidentally, in the middle of this paper, he proves a pattern theorem and then goes on to use it. And this was more or less ignored by the community for, let me think, for 20 years. And then um, uh, suddenly, a lot of people all together realized that this pattern theorem 
was a very nice result. I mean, tucked away in the middle of a complicated paper, it was a very nice result, which allowed you to prove all kinds of other things. That was the first way to prove it. And since then, there must be half a dozen different techniques for proving patent theorems. But I'm going to tell you how the idea of how to prove it in when we have these tubular constraints. So use transfer matrices, and transfer matrices means you use linear algebra. So here's the idea. So this is my tube running up here. This is just some object in the tube. I mean, I'm, I'm in two dimensions, but don't worry about that. Yeah, I'm, everything is going to be so vague that it won't matter what the dimension is. So I can regard this object as a sequence of little sections across it. I can pick the height of those sections to be any finite number I want. They could be, you know, they could be a, a, a single lattice spacing or a thousand lattice spacings. It doesn't matter. And I can build up whatever object I have by, um, by stitching together these sections so that they fit. So if I have some section here, it has to fit with the section below. That means that this, these edges have to, have to line up and so on. Typically, you break along half integer values so you don't have to worry about edges in this direction. You just have to worry about these things lining up. So since I can build it up in this way, I can represent, um, um, I, can, I can sort of represent this process by a matrix in which the rows and columns are indexed by the members of those sections, the things which make up the sections. And I get, um, if I can't have section I following section J in this building up process, the element of the matrix, the IJ element is zero. If I can, then the IJ element isn't zero. It's some positive number. And the positive number is designed to capture whatever information you want to capture in this theorem. So it's not just one, but it's some positive number. Now, so now I have a, um, a non-negative matrix. So now I have the glories of Perron-Frobenius theory um, that I can use. Now, what Perron-Frobenius tells you is that if I have this matrix and I turn some of the positive elements into zero, the spectral radius of the matrix drops. It goes down. And it's that, that, I mean, I can't tell you any more than that because it's all detail. That's what allows you to prove a pattern theorem. And that's why these tubular constraints are so nice because they, they allow you to use these perron frobenius methods. So when you sat in a linear algebra class in your first or second year in university and learned about perron frobenius and thought, what the hell is all this about? Um, this is why Perron and Frobenius did it. Okay, so... Uh, I, I won't even say, that's the pattern theorem, but I won't even read it out. The other technique, another technique that I want to mention is about concatenation and connect sum. So concatenation is a way of stitching together two surfaces. So you take these two surfaces, you delete a bit in this one, a bit in this one, and you run a tube between them, and that, that connects the two together. And when you do that, when you concatenate in that way, that's, that's doing a connect sum operation in, in topology. So if I take um, a sphere and I um, concatenate it with a torus, I go from this um, genus zero object, genus one object, to a genus one object. Now I can make my sphere enormously large and the torus little. And so now I go from having a big sphere to having a big torus when I, when I do this operation. That allows me to prove bounds in one direction between the number of embeddings of a torus and the number of embeddings of a sphere. That's, that's adding the the genus, increase in the genus of the, of the problem. But I need a way of going back. Actually, you can do that in any, in any dimension. You don't need tube constraints. That's a very well-known technique. But going in the other direction is not so easy. So in the other direction, what we want to do is take something like a torus in this tube and find convenient places to cut it so that now I have sort of um, holes in the torus and which I can cap off to form spheres. So that would be a way, if I play my game correctly, of converting a torus into a collection of, of two spheres um, in whatever dimension, in three dimensions uh, I am for the moment. The nice thing about tubes is that tubes have a height function, and they're, it's a bit like a Morse function. And so the Morse function allows you to know where to do these cuts, where to change the homology. And, and that's why the tube constraint works so nicely for this. It works beautifully in a lot of cases, but there is a snag, and I want to mention this snag as the last thing I say. It's a snag in four dimensions. Because if I have a torus in four dimensions and I take a slice through it, 
That's a three-dimensional slice. And I'll see two simple closed curves in three dimensions. They could be knots. In this case, they're both trefoils. One of those is a plus trefoil and one's a minus trefoil. And you can't cap off that to form a sphere because a trefoil isn't a slice knot. And so if you have this problem of a torus whose cross-section is a non-slice knot, then our technique for capping off doesn't work. So in fact, this technique we have works in three dimensions and every dimension five and higher, but it fails in four dimensions. And we're currently trying to find a way around this, this problem because uh, at least some of our results simply fail in four dimensions where we can do it in every other dimension. Okay, thank you for your attention.